Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's another episode of Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio. Today, I'm joined by Sensei Bill Leith. Welcome. Thank you. We'll get started in just a moment. But for those of you out there, if you haven't been to whistlecake.com lately, you are missing out. I know how often that website changes because I'm changing it, not quite constantly, but several times a week. We've got the blog. We've got so many things going on over there to help enhance your lifestyle as a martial artist. And of course, WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com is the place to go for all the things that we do here. If you're a school owner and you haven't checked out Whistlekick Alliance yet, you're missing out. Check out Whistlekick Alliance. If you're not a school owner, join the Patreon. Help support us in our mission to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world. Bill, oh, thanks for being here. Jeremy, thanks for having me. <laughs> and thanks for setting up uh, three of our four guests today. My pleasure. Because um... you get to count setting up yourself. I suppose I do. You do. You you handle the logistics of getting yourself here. Oh, and also shout out to Karate International in Exeter, New Hampshire for hosting us. Yeah. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to talk with you. I'm happy we get to do it in person. Yeah, me too. Me too. We've we've emailed a few times. And it's 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 always nice to put the technology aside and just have a real conversation with people. So we're here to talk martial arts. And the simplest way for us to start our conversation is around the start of your martial arts journey. So what does that look like? What's, uh, if we had, here's a visual that will become apt as we, we get in, because I'm sure we'll, we'll get to there at some point. The first issue of the Bill Leith martial artist comic book or graphic novel, if you would prefer, what, what's, that, what's that book look like? Uh, it's, it's honestly a little stereotypical compared to other books. I mean, I got started in the martial arts because, um, my dad thought it would be good for me, my mm -hmm. brother. So my dad was training with Mr. Durkin, my mm -hmm. sensei, um, in 1995 for a little bit. He thought it'd be beneficial for me and my brother as a physical and mental outlet to help ourselves with some things going on. So mm -hmm. I trained with Mr. Durkin for a year before we unfortunately moved away from the area. Mm -hmm. And then we moved back, moved around a lot when we were younger, just mm -hmm. in general in Southern New Hampshire, not too far. And we moved back. But enough uh, that your your training had to right. start and stop. Took a little back burner. But in high school, my brother had moved on to football, ultimate frisbee, very, very physical person. I was not. Mm -hmm. Not in great shape. Um, not really mentally focused or driven for anything. And my dad said, hey, you should give karate another chance again. So in high school, about 2001, he brought me back down to Mr. Durkin. I've been going strong there ever since. Nice. Okay. And... If I heard you correctly, a year before you stopped the first point in time, right? You yes, so about, about a year of training. Okay. Okay. Uh, I was I was young, so my sure. memory of that might be a little, yeah. little iffy. So we're, you know, it's it's not uncommon for high school kids to be resistant to things that everybody around them isn't doing, right? Like team sports, people tend to go there. Martial arts is generally seen in most schools, most academic schools, right? Not martial arts schools as maybe less cool, right? Uh, was there any resistance to you no. getting back in there? No, I can't say I was one of the cool kids to begin with. So, I mean, you and me both. Uh, <laughs> glad to have a friend. Here. Yeah. Oh, you... um, yeah. So I wasn't resistant at all. I kind of uh, trusted my dad's judgment. Mm. Um, I was getting into martial art movies and shows like that, so it just seemed like a good idea. And, I mean, obviously, I was a very shy, somewhat anxious kid, so I was a little nervous just going there. But once mm -hmm. I got started with Mr. Dirk and Mr. Trainer and the other instructors, I just kind of fell in love with it. And it really gave me that outlet to better myself mm -hmm. and to, honestly, to do something with my with my time because mm. otherwise I just what, what were you doing video games video games I mean reading books which I want to say is a bad thing but you know just sick of myself I had some friends that I was hanging out with but um, really I would a lot of solo so there, there's a, a culture a social component absolutely going in there absolutely and honestly to this day um, all my friends if not most of my friends are people I met at the dojo mm. um, and I actually owe a lot to the dojo besides my very intimate group of friends um, one of my friends from the dojo, she introduced me to my wife. So they were, they were friends in high school and they were roommates in college. And, okay. um, so she introduced us and we've been together for about 10 years now. Nice. So it's all, it's all dojo. It's all dojo. It's all dojo. Okay. And, you know, 
I, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip ahead because you know I, I asked you your email address, and I was pretty sure I remembered this, but it confirmed it. Uh, it looks like it's all dojo. Is your job too? Yeah. So I've been teaching martial arts for 20 years. Um, I mean, I've had a few other things I did out of uh, in high school and in college, but primarily teaching. Karate's been my thing. After college, that was your that was what you started doing. So I was teaching. I started helping out classes when uh, about the time I graduated, mm -hmm. and then took a year off just to figure out what I want to do. Had a very long conversation with Mr. Durkin about potentially running my own school one day, mm -hmm. and he said it would be a great idea. He said you're not going to go wrong also going to college, so I decided to do that too. Mm -hmm. So I was going to college um, between part time, full time, depending on the year. Yeah. Full-time college while teaching karate full-time was entertaining, but we got through it with lots of caffeine and very little sleep. Uh, so, yeah, I just basically since I was 18, I've been teaching karate. What did you major in? Uh, business. Was that because you wanted to open a karate yes, school? Yes. Okay. Mr. Dirk, and as mentioned, you talked with him already. You know, he, yeah. he got his, his business degree, mm -hmm. so he was like, you should do that. And honestly, it was a very good thing for me besides learning some basic business skills, um, just the, the learning to present myself. Mm -hmm. I was learning in the dojo to be in front of a group of people, which to me was like terrifying. The, the, the thought of standing in front of a group of 10 people talking, let alone <laughs> nowadays 50 to 100, depending on what's going on. Yeah. Um, uh, just public speaking between the dojo and school was, was very helpful. I remember the first time I had to do any sort of public speaking in college, I blacked out for a second. I was very happy. I look. I put my hand behind me and I felt the desk. I'm like, okay, I'm somewhat grounded. Mm. Got through it, and I made it a very, very important part of my education to get better at that. Mm. So by the time I graduated uh, from University of New Hampshire, I felt very comfortable doing any sort of presentation like that. I had kind of two stints competing as a kid. The really young years, which you know, I don't remember anything, but mm -hmm. when I got back into it at like 12, 13, it was like two years of competing that I had the same thing happen. I, really? I would start my form and then I would be done. And I did not remember anything in between. Wow. So I get it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's that, that pressure is real. Very real. And I'm happy to say that, I mean, obviously I could still get nervous. Mm. Sometimes it's nerves, nerves. Sometimes it's energetic nerves. <laughs> And, but I'm happy to say that I've also been able to help a lot of younger students and teenagers work on that as well now. Mm -hmm. So it's good to see other people going through the same challenges you have and watch them succeed. And you, you can help them. You've worked through it. Yeah. You've got some context. I get it, as I'm sure you too, <laughs> since you do the same thing. I'm sure those katas look great, though. It wasn't until I realized what was happening and I made a conscious effort to kind of stay present that I started to, to do well. Okay. There was something, there was something <clears throat> about, it, I, I think it was a defensive mechanism, right? You know, mm -hmm. shut down. This is terrifying that once I figured out what was happening and I went, okay, I have so, I don't know what, how, but I, I have to find some way to control this. Something was different in the, in, the energy, right? I mean, this is before everybody had cell phones, so it's not like I have recordings right. of all those all those concert presentations. Did you find but, it was like the? Did you like focus on breathing, or did you mentally prepare differently ahead of time? I'm not sure, but I think what I was doing differently was acknowledging this is scary. It's okay that this mm. is scary, but I've put in a lot of time to be here. My mother has helped support me to be here. We've invested money to be here. I need to be as invested in the moment as everything leading up to it. So it was it was applying the pressure in a different way and saying, you know, it's okay that this is scary yeah. in this moment. I'm going to find a way to be a little more comfortable in the discomfort. I think that's huge. Yeah. And Just I, accepting I, I, it. Yeah, I imagine that's kind of what happened with you after being in the front of the room enough times. Sure. And, um, and I think at the same time, Mark, you talked to Marcus earlier, his brother, his brother was doing a bunch of short films and stuff like that for YouTube. And I started helping him out with that oh, cool. and super awkward at first. And then I, at some point like, you know what, I'm just not going to care if I act like a fool. And I think that also makes a big difference. Like, except that you're going to make mistakes, 
accept that you might look a little goofy. I'm cool accepting my own goofy personality. <laughs> Uh, and then just go with it. And that's part of the training is you're going to make mistakes and learn from it and then move on. Uh, yeah. so. I don't know the order necessarily that these are going to come out, but Marcus and I were talking about th this, this idea that when you're young, you think that people older than you or in the martial arts, more experienced than you have everything figured out. Mm -hmm. And so, because you don't feel that you think you're doing something wrong and then you get old enough and you realize Oh, actually, nobody feels that way. Everybody, everybody's still trying to figure it out because I haven't been this person at this time before, right? Like this, this is new. We, I've never interviewed you before. We've not done this before, right? This is new. So it's okay that, Hey, I'm a little nervous. You're a little nervous. Like, you know, it's, it's natural. We get nervous because we care. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it was funny. I was joking with my wife the other day. Like, I'm, I'm going to be 40 in a couple of years. I'm like, I still feel like I'm a teenager. Somebody's like, I just want to sit in front of the TV and play a video game. I can't, but I would like to. And uh, like you said, like adults are going through the same stuff. Yeah. And it's funny to be in the same shoes as your mentors where they were. And you're like, oh, when I was, when I was a teenager watching these guys, they're going through what I'm going through, but they look like the grandmaster. <laughs> I do that math all the time. I'm like, wait a second. <clears throat> Back when I was going through that, that person was actually two years younger than me. And I thought they were the complete understanding right. of infallible. <laughs> not a chance, not no. even close. Yeah. So given that you have this understanding and this awareness, how does that change the conversations or the way you teach students that you recognize are going through some of these things? I think at least it gives me some perspective. Um, obviously, every student you deal with is different. Yeah. They could be going through the same challenge that you had, but their personality might be different. Mm -hmm. Their What's going on their life might be different than what you went through. Um, but at the very least, it gives me gives me that perspective. Okay, like I understand what you're going through. Mm -hmm. I can listen to you and talk to you about it. And hopefully I can give you some insight from my own experience. If not, I can learn from your experience, even though you're my student, mm -hmm. and hopefully try to bring that around to help them get where they need to go. I mean, right now with um, the way Chuk Tokai, we have black belt testing in two weeks. Mm -hmm. and these people have been preparing, preparing for like a year, if not more, I mean, and there's some adults and some young students going through and I was just talking with a student the other day and she's nervous about it, but she's also like, I won't, didn't say this to her because you want to make sure that they're still doing something to go for the test, but she's a little rock star. Mm. So she's gonna look good, but she's just being too hard on herself, I think. I think. Uh, do you think that spirit is natural to successful martial artists? Or, I, let me take, change the word successful to uh, martial artists of longevity, those who remain in and continue to work. The spirit of being harnessed out of the spirit of perfection. O over, it could be perfectionism or overly self-critical because, you know, I get the sense that, that you might have some of that because you're recognizing in other people. Okay. I have that. Mm -hmm. Most of the people I talk to, I look at my students, right? Like the ones that are doing the best and progressing the, the most effectively, I would say, on their journeys are being really self-critical. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of it. It's funny because if I get something from my dad, it's definitely the, the I want to be the profession part of it. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, I think that could be part of it. I think, or I hope also that the people that are like that, they also do realize that it's a journey. Mm. Don't be too hard on yourself all the time, ebb and flow with it. I think that that's kind of where I'm at now. Like, I know I'm going to make mistakes. I know there's going to be parts of my training, like the past year, I just had a daughter, like, I'm not going to be at it where I was 100% mm. two years ago. Um, and that there's longevity in it. And you have to be a little easier on yourself here and there. Still work on stuff, obviously, because yeah. you're not working on something, you're not having any fun. Uh, but work on stuff and then be okay with, be okay with the imperfection. It's kind of like, I forget what it's called, but there's a Japanese like concept of beauty or artistry. I remember reading a story about a gardener. He had two students. He was trying to decide who was going to be the person to take over his position from him. So both students like were working on the garden, cleaning it, making it perfect. One had it immaculate mm -hmm. and the other student looked at it, was perfectly clean, and just shook the tree a little bit, and little leaves fell down. And that added to the natural beauty of things. 
I hope that makes sense. I'm probably butchering it, it, that story. It, it does, and, and it's reminding me, <clears> that, and I, I don't recall the name of it. There's a Japanese art form where they where they will intentionally break okay. dishes or pottery, okay. and then put it back together, yeah. it, recognizing that there is beauty and imperfection. Right. right. That's exactly what I was going for there. Yeah. You 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 talk about. I think you described it as knowing now how to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. I make a lot of mistakes. We all uh, do. Every day. Every day I count like, that was a good thing I did. That was a mistake I did. Let's learn from that mistake. Mm. Um, I think that's just normal. Whether that's with my karate, whether that's with me teaching a class, whether that's with anything. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sure. Whether that's not driving in a way that maybe wasn't as safe as it should have been. Like, we all make mistakes, I think. Accepting that and just growing from it, mm -hmm. that's huge. That's what martial arts should be about. It shouldn't be about being the perfect human. We're striving to perfection, but perfection is like the mountaintop you're never going to reach. You're just constantly climbing that. And if you do that, like we are talking about, you're going to get good at what you do. Mm -hmm. I, as you know, exist in this, this business ownership, entrepreneurial world, mm -hmm. and so... Yeah, I've got my martial arts lessons and things that I read, and people I get to talk to in that context. But I also read and listen to things in the business space. <clears throat> and I started catching this maybe five to ten years ago, this idea that we do a terrible job culturally talking about our... I don't actually like the word failure, but failures, uh, non-successes, mistakes. Mm -hmm. When, if you look at people who are very high functioning, you know, again, this was coming from the, uh, the business world. They prioritize that mm -hmm. because if you're not screwing up, you're not moving quickly. You're going really slow and there's a time to move slowly. Shout out to anybody who's been to my seminars. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're trying to build a business, you've got to go fast enough that some things are, are hmm. kind of break because then you learn from those mistakes right. so you can fix things and it, it helps you progress. And, and it, um, I don't know where this came from, but there, there was the, this visual that sticks in my head and it's the dinner table of, you know, uh, a successful entrepreneur asking their family, not what did you do today, but what did you fail at today? It's powerful. Because, you know, and, and, I, and I tell my students, and, and you probably say something similar, I'm, I'm just going to guess. If you get something right, you've know, you know one way that it can work. But you don't know that that's the best way. You don't know that it's a great way. And, and how often do people keep doing things the same way because it worked well that one time. But when you don't get something right, when you don't succeed, when you make a mistake, when you fail, you can cross that one off. You don't have to revisit it again. And if you do that enough times, what you're left with is some really good stuff. Absolutely. For sure. That's kind of like in the business world. Mr. Durkin gives me a hard time about this. There's the ready, fire, aim method of getting yeah. the job done. In the ready, aim, fire. I hope I said that right. You did. Um, so I'm definitely the ready aim fire, which can lead to procrastination, not getting stuff done and over preparation. Yeah. And he gives, you know, that's something he's always giving me a hard time about. So I'm trying to be more on the, still have that a little bit. So I'm not going to go and blind to something, but that there, there are times to do both, <clears throat> right? Like there, there are times when the, and this is something I have struggled to learn because I, I used to be ready, fire, aim all the time. I've put the trigger <clears throat> unintentional. <laughs> an intentional pun there on so many things prematurely mm -hmm. that I got so wrapped up in. Can I not? Should I, Hey, we should do this. Oh, I mean, and if, and if you look over the course of my professional career, it's me putting out a lot of things about five years too early. Mm -hmm. There are things in whistle kick we're coming back to now that I tried five years ago that the world just wasn't ready for, which is, is, is kind of interesting. But if I'd sat down and said, is this worth it? Is this worth the time? Am, am ready, aim. Oh, there isn't a target yet. I can pull the trigger, but where's it going to go? Right. Let's move on to something else. And I think learning the different when, 
both philosophies have merit, but learning when to to apply each, I think, is is something that only comes with experience. But I'm just learning those things. Now. Absolutely. Sometimes it's the being able to reel yourself in. I mean, despite the fact that I say I'm more of a ready and fire this stuff, but you get excited about stuff. Yeah. You get excited about a project, and you kind of put everything else in the background, despite the fact that that stuff's working and the stuff isn't. And the stuff I get excited about, I'm like, hold on, Bill, <laughs> chill a second. <laughs> you yeah. only have so much time of the day. Yeah. You mentioned. Your daughter. Mm -hmm. How has having her? Because kids learn by making mistakes, right? I mean, they, they you learn to stand by falling down. You learn to walk by standing and falling down, right? Like kids learn to speak by making weird noises. And one day we go, "Hey, you said a word," right? Like it's it's that constant trial and error mm -hmm. that is how children learn. And somehow we decide at some point that's not a good way to learn, which is utterly ridiculous. But how has that changed things for you, maybe in, in the way that you look at these ideas of, of mistakes, trial, error, and or teaching? How has that changed? You know, I haven't really thought about it, but maybe, maybe just remembering the fun part of it. Because, I mean, a kid falls down, they're about to start crying. You don't Go, oh, no, you don't cry. You go, oh, whoopsies. Like, have a joke about it. And they laugh about it, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I could apply that to teaching as well, just, especially with like people who just start training. You have to remember to yourself back off a little bit. Right. That's a problem that I've had for a long time that I have to, I think I've gotten better at it over the years. Um, but real myself and like, these are new students. Sometimes these students are only five or six years old. You can't give them the same. Uh, you, the same mentality that you would for a 30 year old black belt because they're just not, they just started training so they don't know everything yet. They don't have developmental skills to do it yet. So just be patient, let them have fun with it, teach them those little skills along the way. Um, I hope that makes sense. It, it, it does. Like it does. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I'm thinking of, of someone who actually I, I asked to be on the show quite a few times and he, he refused to do it, but he gave me one of the best lessons I've ever seen. As, as an instructor, and I will I fall back on this so many times. If they're not there, you can't help them. Right. Right. And so, like it, it, it's it's so obvious. But there are so many instructors that whether because they. I'm going to say it this way intentionally hide behind holding their students to incredibly high standards. And that they're they're afraid. They're afraid of their peers telling them that they're not a good instructor because their mm -hmm. students aren't great or. Because what I think happens more often, you want to help them be so good, so fast. You want them to be better than you. You want to give them all the possible value. So that six-year-old, okay, uh, great job. Now let's correct this, 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 and this. They're like, I just gave you everything I had to correct that. And now you want more, right? And they start to burn out. But if maybe you walk it back a little bit, then they show up next class. And then you can give them a little more. And then they show up next class, you can give them a little bit more try to do too much, right? They break, they don't right. show up. You don't want to crush someone's spirit, you want to build their spirit. Right. And you have to remember like, I mean, each system has their own requirements for black belt, but like that kid's six years old now, in four years when he's getting for black belt, he's gonna be 10. I mean, there's such a huge difference. Big difference between six and 10. And honestly, for adults and teenagers too, like in four years, how much can someone grow? Like it's, it's immense. How many people don't develop over the time from start to black belt or start to any period, right? It's, it, well, we I think you aren't doing anything. I think it'd be really difficult in any martial arts program, regardless of what it is to find someone who met the physical requirements of their training and it didn't change who they are inside. Absolutely. Might be a small change. It's obviously easier to see when you take bigger steps right. back, but and everyone's there for different reasons. So that yeah. change might be more obvious or less obvious. But for sure, you're doing something, whether it's martial arts, painting, music, anything, yeah. you're going to get better at it if you put the effort and the time in sure. and the thought into it. Are your reasons for training and teaching now similar or the same? No, oh, that's a thing we didn't, we didn't think about. Hey, uh, what was that? What was that question? Your reasons now versus your reasons when you, when you started, how similar are they? Are we talking just training or teaching or both? I, I don't, can we separate the two? I'm sure. imagining it would be difficult for you to separate the two. Sure. Okay. If, if you can separate, can separate them, yeah, let's, let's break those out. I'll do my best. Okay.
Um, so my reasons now for training, I mean, like I said, it was a very good thing that my dad thought would help me with my confidence, mm -hmm. um, my drive, my physicality. And now I think with my training, I just love it so much. Mm -hmm. I've been doing Wei Chi Ru for, let's just, let's take the 2001 when I restarted, like that's a long time to do something. Yeah. And every day, whether I'm working on or teaching, I'm learning something new. And one of the greatest things I like to see is just looking at other styles too. Like I look at just someone lying on YouTube wasting time and watching that's someone in a Muay Thai fight. I'm like, yeah, that's Wei Chi Ru right there. Watch someone doing, uh, we had a gentleman, uh, Gene Dunn, down for our Wei Chi Con event last year, who was a Shotokan practitioner and a BJJ practitioner. Mm. He was us some BJJ stuff. So like, I was watching Wei Chi Ru, the BJJ. I'm like, so there's always stuff to learn and do. It keeps me excited and it keeps me healthy. Mm -hmm. I think I would not be um, mentally or health wise the person I am right now if it wasn't for the training. Mm -hmm. So that keeps me going with that. And like I said, it's fun. My yeah. friends do this. Like my, my family does this. I have a younger sister who's also a third degree black belt. Uh, so it, it keeps keeps me going. Nice. And as far as the teaching is concerned, we're talking about how much it's changed. Correct. Your, your reasons. My reasons. Yeah. My reason for starting was because my friends were doing it. Um, I had no, when I first started teaching, I was just a brown belt. Um, I had a couple of buddies like, hey, come help a class with us. So like, sure. Of course, they put me up at the front of the room having no idea what I'm doing. Like, we'll be in the back. Just We're going to do the warm exercises. You just watch me and I'll, um, you just mimic me. Okay. They do the first two warm ups and then they start talking with you like, oh. Like, I have no idea what I'm doing up here. It, isn't it amazing? You know, yeah. at, at that point, brown belt, so you've been <clears throat> training three, four years, mm -hmm. and you've been through those warm-ups. Yeah. How many hundreds, thousands of times, but now your mind's blank because you've got to right. remember it. Right. It's crazy. And I remember to this day, I mean, I was a brown belt getting ready for my black belt, and I was 18, 19, and there's this little 12-year-old in the front row, also a brown belt, looks looking at me smirking, like, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> And I was like, I'm going to figure this out. Uh, so it was just an excuse to hang out with people that I was starting to look up to. Okay. And now, again, besides, obviously, I mean, this is my profession. Um, I just love it. I really can't imagine doing many other things full time. Um, I don't feel like I'm going to work. Obviously, there's running any businesses stuff. You have to, like, sit down and sure. get done. But when I'm on the floor teaching, like, I'm just having a blast and I'm hopefully inspiring and changing lives for the better. And I think that's a really cool thing to be able to do. I, I have these conversations, you know, sometimes on the podcast, sometimes not, where we're talking about those big moments in a student's journey mm. that you just, they stick with you, right? And, and, and you step back and you're like, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, of one, I was talking to my assistant instructor, the other day, we had a a six year old come in, and, and we we operate a family class, right? We got the kids class, the adult class, and, and a family class in between, and you know, it's 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 a different dynamic. Yeah. But uh, a dad training with his son, and the first class, the son wouldn't let go of his hand. Mm. So scared, and. It took us, I think, four classes before Corey, my assistant, or I could work with the kid. And and like it took us weeks. Like we had a plan on how we're gonna get this child to to do that. And you know, we've talked about that for a few weeks. It actually had um, another father son duo start the other day, and almost the same dynamic. Kid holding his hand mm -hmm. wouldn't. You know, we're, we're doing techniques on the shields at the, you know, in lines and kid wouldn't, kid didn't want to be in front of anybody. And so having a conversation with dad, like this, this just happened. We just had this win, this success. And it's those that I hold on to because they remind me, okay, we, can, we are making a big For impact sure. here. You got any of those that have happened recently in my chair? Literally having like two or three students just coming through my door in the past month and I'm doing this, having the yeah. same thing happen with, um, um, besides just those experiences that I'm currently working on, those kids are now jumping into class with other kids, which is fantastic. How do you help them get comfortable? It's very different now for me than it was when I was, when I was teaching at Mr. Durkin school, because mm -hmm. Mr. Durkin school, this like 
in, in one classroom, there could be four instructors helping out. Yeah. Um, with me, it's just me, and sometimes I have one of my teenage instructors that's there, which is very helpful. Um, so with my school now, I mean, I, I try to provide as much value as possible to the students. So if we need to do a private lesson to get them comfortable just with me in the mm -hmm. space, if there's that opportunity, we do it. Um, I try to find times where they're with some other students that will be good fits. Like if I know someone has a friend or if someone who's going through okay. something similar. So at least it's not like I can't physically be here helping this kid get in and teaching a class of 10 kids at the same time. So I can set up in a way that we can work around that and just be encouraging and patient. Uh, trusting the parent a little bit too to help guide them in, which isn't always, uh, let's cut that part. I don't want to talk about the parents, if that's okay. I don't want to like bat mouth anyone. No, no, no. no I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't think we, I don't think you said anything that bad mouths the, the parents, but it, I was, about to, I was about to say something. Like, it's not always easy as a teacher to have the parents talk. It's, it's class. not, yeah. it's not. And, and, and if you're okay, I'd rather not, not cut that because when, when we, when we take a look at parents, and this this is uh, you know we're in a school that doesn't allow parents to sit and observe classes. They have cameras set up. Parents can sit in the parking lot if they want, or they go off and they do their thing, because there's no perfect scenario with the parents, right? Because if the if the parents there and it's a shy kid that you're trying to get more comfortable, mm -hmm. you're giving that kid an out. If the parent doesn't think that the kid is trying hard enough, right? You kind of get those, those parents trying to, you know, live vicariously through their kids and they're pushing the kid. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's almost a perfect storm of complexity in helping those kids integrate because you can't, not only can you not treat every child the same, you have to treat all the parents differently. You know, we, we have not had situations where parents are watching kids at my school yet. We have a very small kids program. But one of the things that I've talked about and seen done, and we will implement when that starts to happen, is a code of conduct for parents. Hmm. You're going to sign off on this. If you're going to sit and watch, here are the rules. Hmm. Yeah, I haven't had to deal with that, thankfully. Yeah. Do you have parents watch it? They Absolutely. Do. That's one of the things that Mr. Durkin always chimed in on. He wants parents to watch because he wants them to see the value of what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and very rarely has there ever been a problem. Like, I don't have any problems with any parents at my school. They're all very nice people um, in almost every school yeah. all the parents are right like it's because they see the value and they see the value because they value the things that we help their kids develop in but it can just take one mm. right it, you get it you get enough people together one of them is going to be a jerk right just statistically and yeah it, and managing that can be can be really tough have you had it before? Have I had a challenging parent? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, not at my current oh, I'll school. I'll share a story after this. Okay. Not at my current school with Mr. Durkin. We've had one or two in the past. Yeah. Um, I don't, I'm not going to get into details. No, no, no. I, I, but I, absolutely. I don't want, I don't and want. Sometimes it just comes down to communicating, and sometimes it's a situation where it's just not going to be viable. Uh, but for the most part, we've been very lucky. Everyone's there for a good reason, and not too many stir the pot. Yeah. I had, I had a situation. So, I am I am not actively training with my taekwondo instructor at this time. Just life, mm -hmm. distance, busy, etc. But there was a period of time where I was showing up and helping with classes semi frequently. I won't call it infrequently, but not not every time. And we had an understanding that if he was not there at the start of class, he wanted me to start class. And so it was time to start class. He wasn't there. There was a child and I went over and I kind of tapped the kid on the shoulder. You know, Hey, we're getting rolling here. Come on over. And the dad, don't touch my kid. I don't know who you are. I was like, Oh, oh well, this is a new one. I haven't dealt with this before. You know, I'm there in my uniform. I've got my black belt on. I mean, my, my role in this organization should be fairly obvious. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was fascinating to work through. Uh, and what it ultimately came down to was that parent, that father was just terrified. Yeah. He, he had a lot of fear and, you know, who knows how else that manifested outside of the training environment. And, you know, obviously the, 
my instructor who knew these people who were new. They, you know, that kid was on class like number two or three. Right. And fixed it all. But that has stuck with me because it, it's a situation I didn't even imagine. You know, here I am. I'm doing the best thing that I believe for the kid. And that can happen in any environment. You how know? old did you say you were? Or how old were you at that time? Oh, this was, you know, maybe eight years ago. Okay. You know. Yeah. And, you know, in... in and who was it? Was it the touch from a stranger? Right. There's mm-hmm. so many angles that we could look at this from that that add it, uh, make make it complex. You know, one of the things that I I do now that I had a, a school of my own 20 years ago that I never would have done back then. But it's a different world, and I have a different understanding. We talk about these things differently. I ask the kids like, hey. Is it okay if I grab you and show you how you would use this rear elbow or how you would use this headbutt? Right. Yeah. You know? And they're used to being asked, right? You would ask a kid that 20 years ago. I don't know. I'm a small child. Like, they, they weren't having those conversations. So it's just fascinating to me how we continue to navigate this changing world as, as instructors. And it's an easy thing to do, too. You don't know where someone's coming from. Right. Kid, adult, like... You don't know, like teaching someone to choke, or like people don't like getting tickled or touching the neck. Like, you might grab your shoulders, like something simple as that, and it makes a world of difference. Yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't know <clears throat> what someone's experiences are, and, no. and you know, I think it's natural we tend to filter everything through our own experiences because that's the context right. we have. But the moment you can take a step out of that and realize, okay, statistically, in this room, one of that group of people has been assaulted. Maybe one of those people has committed an assault, right? Like you run those numbers through your school, it, mm-hmm. it, it becomes okay. It can, it can be overwhelming, but it can also really help you understand, I think, how to reach these people and what they might need. For sure. And like you said, looking at it from outside your perspective, like if I was going up to you and say, hey, I'm going to just put you in a quick headlock, you probably like wouldn't think twice about it because you've been doing martial arts your whole life. And you're like, cool, what are you going to do? Do I get to throw you? You you do it. Okay, can you can you do it again? I didn't quite get what you were doing. That show me hard. <laughs> Just don't make me go to sleep. Yeah, it's 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 important as an instructor to remember that it's people first, not martial arts first. Mm. We're dealing with people, mm. and that's that's say critical. say that again. That that's an important distinction. Say that again, please, and talk about that. Right. So as an instructor, we're, we're not, we, we our, our avenue of communicating and teaching people is, is the martial arts, but we're teaching people first, mm. not the martial arts first. We're giving them these life lessons. We're helping them navigate through their life. We're helping them develop change in themselves, whether it's just for the self-defense aspect or for something else. Mm. And I think that if we can remember that, put the martial arts aside just for a second, obviously that's going to be our way of teaching and communicating, just take a moment, like think about what is this person? What are they trying to become? Who are they? And how do I communicate to them? That's, that's what's really important because you're going to get a lot more done if you do that. And you're going to develop relationships that are going to last a lot longer than a week or two. It's true. It's a true story. Mm. Do you ever have days where you don't want to teach? Do I ever have day? I want to say no, but you know, some days like I just want to stay in bed today. I mean, we all have that. We're human. Yeah. I'll I'll admit it. But the second I get on the floor and I bow in, I'm like I'm in I'm in the zone. I have the same experience. Uh, at my instructor, Mr. Durkin's school on the wall, um, there's the teacher's creed, mm. and I every time I do my kneeling bow before class, I, I say this to myself. I've been doing it since since I was in my twenties. What what is, what is that creed? Would you mind? So um, it's I will teach each class as if it's the most important class I will ever teach whether it's one student or 20 students, whether it's a white belt or a black belt. I'll, uh, I am patient and enthusiastic, and I will lead by example. Mm. Not always easy, no, but critical, because you have to show what it is you're trying to get the students to do, and you want to have that energy, that excitement. I can come in sleep deprived because my daughter was up all night, but I still have to put that aside and kind of fake it till you make it. And then I can crash at the end of the day, hopefully just on the mats and not 
No, they don't like home. You know, it's, <clears throat> again, I don't know the order that these episodes are going to come out, but uh, just a short time ago, we heard a story about someone who had something really, really heavy going on and they needed to train. This is a story Marcus was relaying. Mm -hmm. That nobody knew what was going on with that person in that moment, but that coupled with the first part of that creed that is if this is the most important class I will ever teach, because for that person in that moment, that was so critical. And it's something that I think I'll, I'll share this with everyone, and I think this will resonate with you. No secret, I, I consult with martial arts schools, and the number one thing that I have to, quote, fix or help a school with, if the, if the school is not doing well, I have not had a case where the school was doing okay, but the instructor wasn't passionate about their training. Passion for training mm -hmm. is a prerequisite to everything else in a martial arts school. For sure. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, and because of my relationship with Mr. Durkin, I've met a lot of people, seen a lot of people in the schools that failed. They're looking at it business first and not teaching first. You need yeah. both. Yep. You have to be sustainable. Yep. Because um, otherwise you can't do what you're doing. But, yeah, people don't go in with that martial art value and the love for it. Yeah, love, right? Like that's some days, like when I was in, especially when I was in my twenties, when I started saying that to myself, this teacher's creed. I mean, that's when I was in school full time. I was teaching full time. I was commuting to to school and work, and I was getting a few hours of sleep. Like you had to motivate yourself for class, because otherwise you're going to slog through it. And I didn't want to do that because I cared about what I was doing and mm -hmm. I cared about the students. And I also didn't want to get punched in the face while falling asleep during class. <laughs> Still happened, but you know that's just my own lack of skill. <laughs> but at least it wasn't because you were asleep. No, no, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> awesome. You know, now I had reached out to you. You know, we 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 had some back and forth. There was something that, and and, and I know it wasn't your project, but I kind of want to. You want to talk some Ninja Turtles? I want to talk some Ninja Turtles. All right, let's because, talk some Ninja Turtles. Um, because I think it's a good example of how martial artists are often inspired and passionate about things that are tangential to training. Mm. So you, you had reached out and you said, hey, there's this thing going on. You should help promote it. So, yeah, so, so Dover, New Hampshire, where my school is, it was the birthplace of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, that's where the creators of the comic books uh, lived and started the project. And so recently, um, a gentleman was just kind of walking down the street, a huge fan, much more than I am. I mean, I casually watched it, the show as a, as a young kid and played the video games, mm -hmm. but I can't say, like, I know everything about Teenage Mutant Ninja Tur Turtles because I don't. Um, but he was walking down the street, and where their house used to be, there's just an empty lot now. But he's like, you know what? There's nothing in town that mm -hmm. is going to, say that this is where this worldwide phenomenon, something that inspired generations of martial artists, really made the profession of the martial arts huge in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why so many of us are training now today, just even if we didn't watch the show, just because these schools were able to stay in business, um, he wanted to do a little something. So he put a, together uh, a GoFundMe, and with your help, by the way, you were the only person in the martial arts media world that responded to me so really that you were that's ridiculous i'm, uh, so, I'm I, so sorry and, and shame on who i <laughs> don't tell me don't ever give me a list so i, I don't have to know but I'll shame you, on I'll you tell you something funny after the interview oh. um, but yeah, which which is fine like i don't know these people we had a we had communication paths because i think i communicated you when mr Durkin did his interview yeah. so that's why i felt comfortable reaching to you and the other ones were kind of like a shot in the dark uh, but anyway, so Indoor now is a beautiful, very well secured manhole cover with the Ninja Turtles. Come on, isn't that the coolest thing? It is. How, with, how could I? Yeah. With custom okay. artwork from the creators. And at the same time, there was a separate project going on, which I didn't know about until like that day that they released the manhole cover. There's a uh, historic marker now pointing to that spot. Mm. So there's just so many things happening at the same time. I'm like, I'm a new, I just opened my school in Dover. 
No one else is jumping on this. This is an opportunity to spread this in the martial art world. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. And it was just a fun thing to do. It's, I mean, what's more fitting? Can you think of any <clears throat> more fitting way to honor that? I mean, you use the word phenomenon. It absolutely is. I mean, it's if you were to make a list Crazy. of the things that have gotten people, at least in Western culture, into training, you know, it's, it's Bruce Lee first, based on my conversations with people. Mm -hmm. It's, I don't know whether Karate Kid or Ninja Turtles had a bigger effect. It's hard to say, <sighs> but both had a substantial effect. Yes. And then maybe to a lesser degree, I'd say Power Rangers and now Cobra Kai. Right. right? Like those are probably the big five that have created these waves of people coming in. But I, I started just after Karate Kid, but I resonated with Ninja Turtles because by the time... I was sure. old enough to, you know, know what was going on. In fact, I remember the day I discovered Ninja Turtles. Do you? Here, here's a ridiculous story. So I was in first grade waiting for the bus. And these kids are talking about watching Ninja Turtles on Fox 51, the, the Fox affiliate in Maine. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? No, we don't get cable. They're like, it's not on cable. It's, it's on over the air. <clears throat> over the air, if you're really young... We used to watch TV. The signals came in to an antenna on our TV. Not all of us had cable. I was like, oh, we don't have cable. Good old days. Yeah. They said, no, your, your TV does it. You just have a switch or something. I was like, what? Yeah. I was like, my mom told me I couldn't hit that switch. No, but that's how you watch Ninja Turtles. I was like, I don't even know what this is. And I remember I got off the bus. I walked down the short dirt road. I walked in the house. I dropped my backpack. I, how was school? I walked past her. I turned on the TV. I flipped the switch. She's coming. She's like, no, don't do that. I was like, they said. And Ninja Turtles was on. And I remember in that moment saying, this is life changing. <laughs> now, I was six. Mm. So life changing didn't take much. No. But wow. Yeah, this it, it was huge. It was huge. It's huge. It's crazy. I have kids coming and talking about it, and I'm like, you still watch Ninja Turtles? This one kid comes in singing the theme song. I'm like, how do you know the theme song to Ninja Turtles? The um, the new game that was released on Nintendo Switch, Okay, if, if you've played it, is, I think, one of the best side-scrolling games ever. It does. It, it, it pays homage to the spirit of Ninja Turtles as I see it, and it's a ton of fun to play. I was playing with um, some friends out west and i was playing with a couple of their kids mm -hmm. and i didn't quite set the settings right and three random strangers jump in so there's six of us playing turtles so if you have a switch get that game it's absolutely sweet yeah it's, it's a great game when i have time once again maybe i'll That's try right. it uh yeah i'm gonna have to roll over to to dover and, and check that out and yeah. take some photos it's, so it's, it's, it's very cool. easy to access nice quiet side road so nice. i would definitely do it nice what you spoke a little bit to this, but speak more. What what made you? Because it wasn't even your project, right? Initially, I when when we had started talking about this, right? You were so passionate about it. I missed the part where it wasn't your project. I know. I want. I, I remember. I felt bad for a second. Reading text, like I just want to make it very clear, this is not mine. Like I wanted to make sure I was yeah. having integrity with it. Um, you know, like I like I said, Mr. Durkin says I'm too ready, aim fire. I was like, let's ready fire aim this and just mm. do it. So I jumped on it. And went from there. It was a very cool experience. So one nice. of the creators was there, and he did a little interview, and it was nice. Great. And I honestly like made some contacts in the Dover community, which I think is important as a martial arts school yeah. to be part of that community. Coming from the Atkinson Dojo, Mr. Durkin School, I had that. Now I'm working on developing that again. So yeah. it was beneficial. Well, I think one of the best things... Well any school can do is find ways to integrate themselves into the community. If, if people see you start to finish as, you know, three to 8 PM and, and you don't exist the rest of the time, that's not how you build a large, successful, uh, take large off. That's not how you build a successful school, whether your definition of success is student count, dollars, community impact, whatever it is, mm. you need to be tied in. And that's really true of any business. The more sure. you can tie yourself in, the better. And if you get to do it with cartoon characters, then you should probably jump on it. All the better. Was there, you know, we mentioned some of those other things, Power Rangers. Were any of those oh, important yeah. to you, too? Oh, yeah, there was a lot of Power Rangers um, growing up. 
we had Power Rangers, we had X Men. I mean, mm. those are kind of the big things at the time that I remember. And then Karate Kid was around, but I probably didn't watch it till later in my life. Yeah. And obviously, like, I got into all that, and I, especially when I started training again as a teenager, like, let's watch all the Karate Kids. Yeah, we, we've got we've got some, <clears throat> some good stuff that's come out. Unfortunately, martial artists don't seem to like to support any content. Uh, looking at all of you who refuse to watch Into the Badlands. <laughs> don't even know what that is. <sighs> Such a great show. Such a great show. Uh, but I, I think, you know, the cultural side of what we do, you know, that, that we train, we teach... It changes our lives. And we want to be able to tie into that in, in more casual ways, whether that's TV and movies or mm -hmm. comic books or video games or whatever, because it reminds us, you know, hey, you know, no, I can't quite do that, but I can almost do that. I can almost do the real life version of that. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like the new Avatar, that's that's the one people are telling me I need to watch. The new I had a student tell me that the other day. Yeah, and they kept telling me, don't watch the... The movie watch the netflix series the the animated series is also very good but really not a lot of hook back to martial arts okay but yeah i'm hearing that the, the new series is is really good so it's on my list there's a lot of things on my list i don't have nearly enough time to watch no i'm trying to go through right now i'm kind of on a martial art book buying kick mm. i don't have time to read so i'm just <laughs> trying to i'm just trying to reread a few books right now or just flip through them and get it what i can get in Something like 90% of books are never read. Well, I hope one day... Which explains my bookshelf. Books. Yes. <laughs> Same. Awesome. Well, did, did, believe it or not, we've we've rolled through. Our time is, is... I mean, not that we have like this hard stop or anything, but I try to be respectful of time. And, you know, generally we roll about an hour. So we'll, let's start to wind down okay. here. And uh, First thing I want to make sure we say, how can people get a hold of you? So they can get a hold of me through my website, leafkarate.com. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I have my own YouTube channel where I share um, martial art videos and seminars and um, working on sharing some more martial art mindset videos as well. Oh, nice. Uh, so that's, that's been kind of picking up a little bit. Okay. And those are, the, those are the primary methods. Okay. We'll, we'll get those linked up in the show notes. We'll still kick martialartsradio.com. And yeah, this, this, is, this has been fun. So here, here's what I'm, I'm going to close this out and I'll throw it back to you to, to wrap you know, okay. so your, your last <clears throat> words, so to speak. Hey, you out there, check out the YouTube, the Facebook, the Instagram, all the things for, for Bill that he's got going on. I appreciate you being here. This, this has been fun. It's, we haven't talked Ninja Turtles in a while. That used to be a subject that came up a lot. Okay. And it's funny, we, we tend to go in these, these circles. So who, maybe the next couple episodes we'll be talking about Ninja Turtles as well. If you want to support us, you know, Anything that seems appropriate, but the, the, the thing that is easiest, fastest, and free is tell people about what we're doing. Share this episode. Share another episode. Share the show overall with people. Please help us grow. As we grow, we get more options. We get more options for people. We get more options for advertising. How, how, how would this show look if we had ads every episode, but it meant I was going global? And we're recording with people literally anywhere. What, what if it was that, you know, logistics were not keeping us from necessarily getting a face-to-face -face with somebody? That, that's where I want to take it. So your help is appreciated. And if you want to email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. So, Bill, we've, we've been all over the place. It's been good stuff. I'm glad we got to chat. Same. How do you want to close? I don't know. Um, what, do you want, what do you want them to, to take from this? I mean, I think that if you're a martial artist listening, I don't know, I'm the one to be giving advice to so many people. I mean, of course, but this is uh, your episode. Weird. Uh, I think, I think that, um, just enjoy your training. Mm -hmm. We talked about be okay with making mistakes. Um, accept that that's part of life and just explore your martial arts. Make sure that you're training realistic techniques. Um, Make sure that you're exploring every aspect of what you do, physically, mentally, spiritually. Mm -hmm. I think if you do that, you'll be successful. And at the end of the day, you got to make sure you're having fun. Because you're not having fun on the floor, you're not going to keep doing it. So just get out there, train, have fun, learn some stuff.
training and teaching now similar or the same? Oh, that's a thing we didn't we didn't think about. Hey, oh. Is there a mute button? You know what we'll do? We're just going to let this ride and we'll trim this out. Hi, Andrew. Thank you for calling Karate International. This is Jeremy Lesniak. Would you like to talk on the Whistle Proof Podcast today? <laughs> that would be fun if it was it's like not a, a telemarketer. But statistically, that's a telemarketer. It's going to be apparent like, how dare you? You know what? Andrew's going to trim this out and put it at the end. Cool. Yes. <laughs>